way too much power. And Rhode Island wouldn't come on board until they had a convention. They, they never got, you know, they never had a separate referendum to see if the Rhode Island people would eventually be in favor. They had to have a convention, which is where the state legislators just meet with different hats on and call themselves convention delegates. And then they eventually joined the rest of the states. So Rhode Island comes on board, and we finally have all 13 states in process. But I mention this story because uh, the number one concern was that this government was going to be too big. Okay, so a critical point in this, in, in knowing what the Constitution was all about at this point is, it was a government of enumerated powers. This was an inevitable part of the deal. That is to say that the Constitution is only a list of things that the government can, the federal government can do. Everything else is reserved to the states. And that's, that was a, that was a, an implicit part of the contract. It was an agreement between the states, a, a, a almost sort of like a treaty between the states. And everyone would buy in, would give the federal government these powers, give them authority in these areas, but nothing more. If it's not there, the states have it. And to reiterate the point, the Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment, would be added just to emphasize this point. It's a government of strictly enumerated powers. If it's not on the list, it doesn't exist. And that list is found in Article I, Section 8 pretty much all of it, of the powers of Congress and on Article Section 8. And if you look, at, I'm sure some of you have a handy constitution with you, if you look at the list on Article 1, Section 8, um, here on page 19, it's, uh, it's yeah. a pretty short list. You, you, you get, it starts on half, two-thirds way down page 19, page 20, and then halfway down page 21. That's pretty much it. You'll find the entire powers of the federal government, as conceived by the framers, just on basically two pages. Of, of these little tiny pages. Well, imagine today if Congress were trying to keep itself to that list of powers. Things have, things have changed quite a bit. Um, so that was important. It was an enumerated powers only. Now, the interesting thing is, a lot of people today in Congress still don't get it, still don't understand that this is a government of enumerated powers and enumerated powers only. States, by contrast, are governments of residual powers or another word we use for it in the law is police powers. States can do anything they want to help the health, safety, welfare, and morality of the people. So the state of Kansas, does not, the legislature does not need to look to a list of specific types of laws it can pass. It can pass any law that it wants that, it is, that is not banned or barred by a specific provision of the Kansas Constitution, which means just about anything uh, that's not doesn't infringe upon some right that are in our Kansas Constitution or some right in the U.S. Constitution. Now, this concept that you have to limit yourself to certain powers is something that some members of Congress still don't get. Um, and I'll give you an example. You might have seen this interview on Fox News Channel in um, it was either the end of February, beginning of March, and uh, I think it was uh, Chris Wallace was interviewing uh, Arlen Specter. Known, also known as Starlin Arlen Specter, uh, who grew up in Russell, Kansas, and then moved off to Pennsylvania, where he started as a Democrat, then became a Republican, then became a Democrat, and now is a not very much liked Democrat who's a in the Senate, right? Well, Starlin Arlen Specter was asked by um, by Wallace, he said, you know, this is before his past, he said, uh, Senator Specter, you have been on the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate for so many years, you are one of the uh, preeminent legal minds in the United States Senate, how do you answer critics of Obama's health care plan who say that the power to compel people to purchase insurance is not found in the United States Constitution? And Smarlin Arlen kind of answers, well, those arguments are completely unfounded. You know, he just says, you know, as if to make it so. And then he says, uh, furthermore, look at what Massachusetts did. Massachusetts required its people to purchase health insurance, and we will do the same thing. I've answered your question. Well, that answer would have gotten an F in my constitutional law class. Why? Because states are governments of residual powers. States can force you to buy health insurance. They can force you to buy car insurance. Kansas can force you to buy whatever kind of insurance it wants to, if the Kansas legislature so deems it next year. But the federal government has to look for this list. If it's not on the list, they can't do it. And the amazing thing to me was that Specter had been in the U.S. Congress for all those years. Before he was a senator, he was a, he was a representative. And he never evidently got the idea that he's supposed to be looking at this Constitution before he passes a bill. How many members of the Congress today, you know, actually look at the Constitution and say, well, can we do this? Uh, I don't see this power anywhere. 
they, they think of themselves as you know elected problem solvers. Well, there's a problem. Do we need uniforms in schools? Well, we, well, we should do that congressionally. Let's mandate. Remember when Clinton was talking about having that? Oh, well, we've got some problem uh, with fat in foods uh, or, or carbonated beverages having too much sugar. Let's mandate it. We're Congress. We'll solve, we'll solve the problem. Any problem, we'll, we'll take care of it. Oh, is there a TV camera out there? Okay, we'll, we'll tell them that we're going to take care of this problem. And so you have this bizarre situation where Congress is constantly looking for things, problems to solve and decides that they are the ones who have whatever power they want to have. And that's not what the Founding Fathers envisioned. Now, the other uh, important element was the Bill of Rights. Now, the, uh, okay, so the Constitution goes up to the uh, conventions of the various states in 1788, and they start deliberating on this. And uh, it's clear that the anti-federalists, the federalists are the proponents of the Constitution, and they would soon become the Federalist Party. The framers didn't actually talk about parties in the Constitution. They were, they were hoping that parties wouldn't necessarily emerge, that everybody would just kind of agree on a certain philosophy of government. But anyway, the Federalists, the proponents of the Constitution, are arguing that the, that the Constitution should be, should be ratified by these states. And the anti-Federalists come in and say, no, we, we see all kinds of problems. Just like George Mason said, this is going to be too difficult to amend. And most importantly, it doesn't have a Bill of Rights. And if you read the Federalist papers, which are basically a bunch of op-eds, newspaper editorials written by James Madison and uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, if you read their Federalist papers, they basically say, well, you don't need a Bill of Rights because we have drafted this government so small. This is such a tiny government. Its powers are so limited, it couldn't possibly violate anybody's rights. That was, that was basically Hamilton's argument, that this federal government is not going to violate anybody's rights. How could it? But the uh, anti-federalists, uh, thank goodness, uh, held their ground. They said, no, we, we think we need a Bill of Rights here, like some of the state constitutions already had. Most famously, Virginia's Declaration of Rights was seen as one of the models and the uh, examples of what a Bill of Rights should look at. Look at. And so they, um, they, they kept on pressing their case. And finally, in Massachusetts, in the Massachusetts Convention, they came up with a Massachusetts Compromise. And that was this. The Federalists said, OK, if we agree to put a Bill, a bill of Rights, amend the Bill of Rights into this, right away, as soon as the new government is formed. Will you anti-federalists agree to ratify? And the anti-federalists said, deal, we'll do it. And so that Massachusetts Compromise was then replicated in the other states. That, was, that had to be made. The Bill of Rights was a precondition for it to be to come into existence. Now, the interesting thing is, well, how are you going to seal the deal? How are you going to ensure, how are you anti-federalists going to ensure that the federalists hold, yeah, hold true to it? Well, the way they did it was through constituent instructions which unfortunately have all that this will have disappeared from American political life. Constituent instructions were issued by the various states to their new representatives in Congress. These were instructions from the people of the state of Delaware to the representative or from the town. If they'd have a town meeting, you know, the, the uh, town meeting of uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, which would instruct uh, the member of Congress to uh, ratify a Bill of Rights. And, and that was how they and, Enforce the instructions. Indeed, some of these instructions were sent with the members of Congress to the first Congress, saying, "Here are the things we want. We want the protection of the right to bear arms. We want the protection of the uh, right to peacefully assemble." Blah blah blah. blah. And so they did. Uh, Madison once again was the man holding the pen, and he, he started drafting uh, the Bill of Rights and editing and narrowing it and cutting it down. Very. He was a he was a wordsmith who always made things shorter. And to a certain extent, I wish Madison hadn't shortened things so much because if you look at his original versions of some of the elements in our Bill of Rights, some of the other parts of our Constitution, they were much more specific. And I wish we had more specificity because the Supreme Court, when you give them generalities, they like to play with those generalities. They like to find the, the play in the joints. And unfortunately, it oftentimes is a disservice to the Constitution. 